Welcome to this video on the ethics of euthanasia. Our goal is to analyze the ethics of euthanasia through both the Catholic and secular viewpoints. And in order to do this, we need to first really understand what euthanasia is. Uh, first of all, euthanasia is really any medical process that intentionally ends the life of the patient. Um, there is also a related phenomenon called assisted suicide or assisted dying, and that's where a medical professional helps somebody end their life, either through the prescription of drugs or setting up a, a system that the patient can end their life themselves. There are then five types of euthanasia, and these all apply to, well, most of these will apply to assisted suicide as well. First of all, there's voluntary euthanasia, where the patient is able to give their permission, their consent, um, and that is fully conscious and they're able to give that consent um, in, in a meaningful way. Um, there's also non-voluntary euthanasia where uh, the patient wasn't able to give their full consent at the time, but may have previously expressed the wish to, to go through with euthanasia. Um, and there's also involuntary euthanasia where the patient is unable to give consent and that's usually when a patient has um, had a bad brain injury or something like that, and um, they're in a vegetative state, they, they don't need machines to keep them alive, but, um, but they aren't able to give that consent for euthanasia. There's also what we would call active euthanasia. Um, that's when drugs usually are given to um, uh, actively end the pa patient's life. And there's passive euthanasia where um, care is withheld from that patient and that then causes the the patient's death and that's usually um, life support uh, that can also be um, withholding food withholding um, water especially um, when that's um, when it's a bit further away from the end of life and that those treatments whether that be life support or giving even food and drink aren't a burdensome thing to that person um, so that's that's what when we're talking about euthanasia those are some of the terminology that we need to be able to get you to and why is euthanasia an issue well i think there's probably two things to really note first of all in new zealand we have just had euthanasia legislation go through so this was um, through the end of life choice um, bill, which was put through by um, the ACT MP, David Seymour. Um, that passed in parliament and then went to a referendum, which also passed. So the euthanasia um, legislation has been enacted in New Zealand and is now legal for people who are terminally ill um, to end their life through the euthanasia. I think it's also quite relevant in today's age. I mean, it's things like euthanasia have always been, I guess, around in a sense, but it's become a lot more popular. I think also a lot of that's to do with the advance of medicine. Um, people are generally a lot more afraid that they're going to end up um, in old age with a real reduced function um, and no quality of life, um, but being kept alive for an extended period in hospital. And I think that sort of causes uh, the fear that um, their life won't be worth living, their life will be one of suffering. Um, so I think this is, and along with a lot of other things, has prompted um, a lot of the euthanasia debate that we have today. One thing that we can ask when we look at euthanasia is, is death a natural part of life? I think there's both answers for this, especially from a Catholic point of view. Um, and it also both answers are really important to us as people. Um, we all have a sense that a death, a good death especially, is part of a normal human life. But death also has a certain quality about it that uh, allows us to question why. Why has death been allowed? It doesn't seem like that's something that should be. Um, and if we look to the wisdom of our Catholic tradition, we can really get some clues as to why this is. First of all, we see in the Bible that death was not an intended part of God's creation, especially not for humans. 
um, and we look at the the creation story um, death was introduced after the sin of Adam and Eve it was not something that was intended by God for us um, and so we see it as something that that is is not something that we were intended to have, not part of the plan for us. Um, so that is one sense, but there's also that healthy sense that uh, death is a part of the human condition. Um, we see in Ecclesiastes this idea that there is a time for everything. There's a time to be born, there is a time to die. Um, and it's certainly a healthy sense that, that we need to come to terms with uh, the fact that our time on earth is limited. So death is certainly part of the human condition in a Catholic view and, and in a sec secular point of view. It is part of our human life that we have to come to terms with. Um, but it is not what was intended from the beginning. When we look at death um, and we look at the word euthanasia, um, one, one thing that really sort of leaps out to us is that what, what, what is a good death? Well, euthanasia is aiming at a good death. In fact, the word itself, uh, you um, in Greek is good and thanatos is um, death. We've got the picture of thanos there, um, sort of same group, uh, root word in Greek. Um, so when we are talking about euthanasia, we're talking about how do we have a good death? And the proponents of, of um, euthanasia as in, as in mercy killing um, would say that some people have um, uh, such unbearable suffering that the best death that they can have is, is to end their own life or the, the best thing that we can do for them is to, to end that suffering through ending their life. And Whereas from a Catholic point of view, there are other options there. And particularly, we might talk about something called palliative care. When we look at it from a Catholic point of view, one of the key things in a good death is um, the ability to um, have uh, that, um, that connection with God and with others in our death. Um, and this is particularly important for um, uh, for Catholics to receive the last rites and viaticum. The last rites, particularly the anointing of the sick, um, which is kind of a strengthening on, uh, it does have some healing powers, but it's also a strengthening um, of our soul uh, to, to live the suffering of death well. Um, and the viaticum is the receiving of the Eucharist um, at, at the time of death. And it is, viaticum means uh, food for the journey. Um, so we, we sort of see the importance of death. And, and a, lot of, um, a lot of people really sort of begin to question what is really important in their lives at the moment of death. We see a lot of people who, who begin to consider the um, the existence of God at that time, it's a really important time to live it well. Um, and hence the importance of um, the ability to to have these last rites, to have these um, these um, this added grace from the church. When we talk about euthanasia, one of the terms that's often spoken about in the debate is this idea of a right to die. Um, and this is an interesting right. It's not something that is on the Universal Declaration of Rights. And there's a question, do we actually have a right to die? So people who campaign for euthanasia would say, yes, we have a right to a, a dignified death um, and a dignified death of our choosing. Um, and whereas Catholics would probably agree with the dignified part of that, but maybe not the second part. From a Catholic point of view, there are a couple of reasons why we wouldn't say that we have a right to die. Um, the first of all, we, we acknowledge, acknowledge through the scriptures, through our Catholic worldview, that our lives have a purpose, and that's a purpose that's beyond us. Um, 
we, uh, we don't get to make up that purpose, it's something that we discover. And through this, we're actually not the master of our own life. We, it's a general Catholic and Christian view that actually God is the master of our lives through his providential care of us, through the way that um, he gives us a meaning and purpose in our life. And also that God is the, the master of life and death. It is God who has the ultimate authority over life and death. And we see this time and again in scriptures. One example, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And that's from Psalm 139. This can be contrasted a little bit with, and this is not every secular view, but there's certainly some secular views, views do sort of promote this, and you do see this sort of thinking out there. Um, this view is really sort of characterized by this idea that I have the right to do anything with, for myself as long as it doesn't harm others. And this is really the principle of autonomy taken to the extreme. Um, it's really, I have the right to do whatever I want myself, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. This comes from a lot of different sources, and um, we can sort of see that um, the individualism of, of Nietzsche and, and others really feed into this. But um, somebody who gives it a really sort of strong expression is, is the English philosopher John Stuart Mill. Um, and he says, the the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So the only reason that we can um, we can stop somebody doing something is because it's harming others. So he goes on to say, over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So we see how this is a very different view from the Catholic point of view. Uh, again, not all secular people would, would hold this view. Um, and a lot of people would say, well, actually, you know, it does matter what you do with yourself. Um, so there's a question, that's sort of the perspective that the right to die comes from. Whereas from a Catholic perspective and also this perspective of the universal declaration of rights, which which is really based on the dignity of the human person, um, the, the right to die doesn't exist as such. Certainly, when we talk about the right to die, it does conflict with the right to life. Um, it does conflict with an, another, a lot of the other rights as well. So that there's another sort of question there, how do we balance it with those other rights? We can also look from this perspective, the perspective of rights and duties based ethics or deontological ethics, um, at the, the rights and duties of, of doctors and medical professionals. Um, when we look at the Hippocratic Oath, which is uh, the oath way back in ancient Greece that, um, that doctors would take, and, and versions of it are still taken to this day, um, the, the oath um, really um, puts into practice that principle of non-maleficence, or the idea that you can't do harm to your patients. Um, in the Hippocratic Oath, it says, I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I am asked, nor will I will advise such a plan, which goes to show that euthanasia is by no means a new issue. We're talking about ancient Greece here. Euthanasia does, in fact, um, harm the medical profession. Um, by changing the, I guess, the relationship of the physician, of the doctor or or, or medical professional nurse um, who will be administering um, this um, euthanasia or assisted suicide to the patient. Um, and it, it really, um, when you are taking, for whatever good purpose, when you are taking the life of another human, um, it does have a certain desensitization to the taking of other human life, and I guess to the preciousness of human life. 
so in a sense like the the right to die doesn't make sense as a right there might be other reasons or consequential reasons to argue for euthanasia but um, the right to die perhaps is a little bit of a shallow argument and also uh, we beg the question like why do we disapprove of things like suicide if we are, um, if we are campaigning for euthanasia Our last look is at the the consequential arguments or the utilitarian arguments for and against euthanasia. There's the obvious argument that euthanasia does reduce suffering. Of course, as a Catholic, we would say, well, we are reducing suffering by reducing the sufferer, um, by, by killing the sufferer rather than treating the, the suffering. Um, but this, this is when we look purely at the consequences, this is, this is a, a weighty argument. Um, certainly people who are in last stages of, of cancer or who um, are, live with chronic pain is a real suffering. And how, how do we deal with that? Um, and this is, I think, this is one of the reasons why the, the campaign for euthanasia has been so successful because these cases are, are right in front of our eyes and that they do attract our sympathy. Some of the negative consequences around euthanasia are less pu publicized. The first, I think, is that along with the ability to, to end suffering, um, there can be a certain pressure to die. Um, and this can be felt by people who are elderly and feel like they're a burden on their their relatives or on the, the health system um, be, because they require a lot of care. And there's always the question, you know, wouldn't it be easier if you, you just got euthanized? Um, there's also that sense of economic pressure. Uh, we see in these days of COVID that our health system is strained. Um, or at least if you know if COVID numbers got larger and in other parts of the world this has happened, there are limited resources to go around. And so um, when you get that sort of pressure, um, it's easy to, to think that, well, you know, if, if we euthanize this person, that's an extra bid that we can give to somebody else. Of course, most people won't do this, but it really opens the opportunity for abuse. These questions in a larger sense, and this is really getting into the wider implications um, of what the overall societal view of the preciousness of each life, what effect does euthanasia have on our view on that each life is precious? How does it how you know, how does it help us respect the elderly um, and those who uh, need a lot of care? How does it help us respect the disabled um, and those with terminal illnesses? The last um, consequence that is, um, I guess, you can see through um, how euthanasia has rolled out across the world is the idea of bracket creep. So in New Zealand, the euthanasia law is really tightly defined um, as those who are, have a terminal illness. And, and uh, I think within 12 months of um, having the prognosis of, of, um, of passing away. That's a fairly defined group. So not everybody who, who really just felt bad about their life could, could receive euthanasia. But it, what we've seen in other countries that have um, legalized euthanasia is that the group of people has got bigger over time. Um, and that's called bracket creep. Um, so a case in point of this is that in, in the Netherlands and Belgium, I think the, ne uh, the Netherlands was first in 2005, um, uh, the legalization of euthanasia for children. Um, and which sort of begs the question, how can children actually give proper consent um, for euthanasia? It, it's when we open the door um, to euthanasia, it's very hard to see how these people can eventually not be included. And we need to be really honest uh, 
and and prepared for that if if we are arguing for euthanasia.